Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for turning on on this really chilly Friday night. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Francesca Stavrakopoulou discussing her new book, God and Anatomy. She is joined tonight in conversation by Candida Moss. Through good times and bad, Harvard Bookstore will continue to bring authors and their work to our virtual community. Our spring season is in full swing, and you don't want to miss out on our lineup. Make sure to check out our event schedule at harvard.com events where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at, at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to purchase a copy of God and Anatomy, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you. You also have the option for closed captioning for this talk. If you would like captions for this event, click the CC button on your screen. Thank you again for tuning in in support of our authors, our incredible booksellers, and our landmark independent bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now I am so excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Francesca, Stravakopoulou has been a professor of the Hebrew Bible and ancient religion at the University of Exeter, UK. She has worked in television on the BBC and Channel 4, presenting shows on the historicity of the Bible and the Hebrew Bible, and the role of women in biblical times and the developments of biblical texts, including primetime BBC series, Bible's Buried Secrets, which was broadcasted in the US on Netflix, and it's very good. She is joined tonight by Candida, Candida Moss. Candida is the Edward Cadbury Professor of Theology at the University of Birmingham, UK, and an award-winning author of five books, including Bible Nation, The United States of Hobby Lobby. She writes for the Daily Beast and is a frequent news commentator for CBS and CNN. Tonight, they are discussing God and Anatomy, in this fantastic, fascinating book, Francesca looks at how the Abrahamic God was not always the mysterious being the Bible portrays him to be. In this revelatory study, Francesca presents a vividly corporal image of God, a human-shaped deity who, who walks and talks and weeps and laughs, who eats, sleeps, feels, and breathes, and who is undeniably male. The Los Angeles Review of Books calls it a tour de force and a triumph. And on that note of praise, I am so excited to turn things over to our speakers. Francesca, Candida, thank you so much for joining us. The virtual stage is yours. Hi. <laughs> Hi, and thank you so much for having us. Um, I have to agree. I thought that this was a fantastic book, somewhere between reading like a fascinating collection of essays or in which you can find like the best pieces of information you might want. And also just a kind of real page turner with all of these revelations I didn't know about. So thank you so much, Francesca, for writing the book. And um, I have to start by asking kind of the obvious question. I think for anyone who sort of grew up either as a Christian or from a kind of Christian background, the idea of God having a body, I think people would hear that and think, oh, you mean Jesus, but that is not what the book is about. This is about the body of God. And so my first question is, you know, why write this book? And tell me like, what is the evidence for God having a body? Because a lot of people would say, well, that's just a metaphor. Yeah, well, um. I wrote the book because when I first went to university, um, I really wanted to find out more about the origins of the God that was still worshipped today. And I couldn't understand why the gods and goddesses that I loved reading about when I was a kid. So the gods of ancient Greece and Rome and Egypt and Mesopotamia, how they not survived into the modern day. And yet this other God that had been around at the same time had. So I went to university and started to study the Bible properly. I learned Hebrew and biblical greek etc and and it seems to me that this this was a god that was very much like those deities but none of my university professors were talking about it they were saying to me oh no it's just a metaphor this language is just poetic um so this is the book that i've been wanting to write for several years um as an academic you know we never get a chance to write exactly what we want to write all the time we're too busy teaching most of it but i just felt that it was the right time for me to do it and 
the evidence that we have that he had a body is in the texts themselves. This is not simply poetic language or metaphorical language. All of that imagery comes from a historical reality in which the original ancient worshippers of this deity understood that God had a human shaped body. Um, and this is the language in which they, they describe him in the texts. Yeah, and you make such a compelling case for that in the book, like all of the sort of images that you have in the book, all of the descriptions of statues of seeing God face to face. I think a lot of people thought, well, you couldn't do that. And I think especially at this moment in history, it's important to ask if God has a body. What is it like? Because to look at Renaissance art, to watch The Simpsons, the body of God in The Simpsons, uh, he's wearing a white dress, he has a long white beard. What is the body of God like in the Bible? Well, it changes over time. So um, in the collection of texts, that most of the texts that, um, that are found in what Christianity calls the Old Testament, um, what in Jewish tradition is known as Tanakh, um, what scholars tend to refer to as the Hebrew Bible, in most of those texts, God is a relatively kind of virile, relatively young, strapping warrior-like deity who has this kind of black blue hair and this ruddy, radiant, dazzling skin, this kind of emanating radiant light, this kind of red hot light coming out from him. Um, but then he changes over time by the time we get towards some of that later material in the Hebrew Bible. So the book of Daniel, um, which was written about the second century BCE, by this point, that, that dazzling, hot, red radiance has gradually shifted to take on a more celestial kind of colour, more like the colour of the stars. So it's become a lot brighter, a lot whiter. And consequently, so has God's hair and his beard. So whereas he was once this very kind of good looking, dashing kind of deity, um, he sort of starts to take on the features of not an elderly God, but an aged deity. Um, so the, the gray hair or the white hair of wisdom um, that we associate you know, with elders in our own communities. And uh, yeah, so that kind of starts the beginning of this shift in visual culture, whereby he starts to be imaged as an old white guy with a beard. Right, and we're all really familiar with that. But there is so much that you just said that I know everyone <laughs> who's listening will be leaning forward to say, did she say virile about God? <laughs> and so there's a lot to pick up on that. And maybe I'll start with virile. And I think when people talk about bodies, it automatically invokes and invites questions about things like skin tone and mm. gender. And when you say a word like virile, I wanna ask you about God's sexual orientation. Does God have one? Um, yeah. And can we yeah. hear about it? Yeah, so this is, I mean, you know, the important point to, that I make throughout the book is that God was not extraordinary in his cultural context. This book kind of sets him in his natural habitat in ancient Southwest Asia, um, from the Iron Age through to the Roman period and beyond. And uh, this was a world in which the gods naturally had human shaped bodies and they were naturally gendered in similar ways to, to human beings. Um, divine gender was much more um, elastic and fluid than perhaps was the case for a lot of their human worshippers. Um, but generally we're talking about aspects of male and female um, and sort of a spectrum of masculinity and femininity. Some deities were kind of uh, um, third gender, it's not a great term, but it's a term that's often used to talk about deities who could move between very formal gendered, binary gendered roles quite easily. But Yahweh was very much in keeping with the majority of um, warrior deities in that he was very much male, very much masculine. Um, and in this ancient world, to be a male, to be a warring male, was to be hyper, hyper masculine. And that hyper masculinity was marked by certain sorts of body features. Um, obviously, in terms of genitalia, uh, this was a deity equipped with male genitalia. Um, but also this was a god who was, who was the epitome of cultural constructs of male beauty. And that male beauty was this very virile, hyper masculine, very sexy, um, kind of dark haired and sort of dark beard, a groomed, a beautiful groomed beard. We're not talking about some kind of unkempt hairiness. We're talking about beautifully groomed, um, a guy who, a, a God who smelt nice. Um, 
who was oiled in, in, in spiced perfumes. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about that kind of construct of masculinity, we're talking about something that's very much within a broadly binary frame and something that's very much on the hyper-masculine end of that frame. Right, and I think everyone here is familiar with sort of hyper-masculinity in today's sort of modern world, but it's, it's interesting to hear that part of that involves sort of grooming behaviors that today or in other cultures in antiquity or the medieval period might have been gendered as hyper-feminine. You know, yeah. oiling, oiling your body doesn't necessarily say hyper-masculine. But I have to say, as I, as I was reading your book, at several junctures, you kind of allude to what might be considered by some people to be sort of human weaknesses of a sort. Mm. Like he gets tired, he takes naps, he doesn't like it when things are too noisy, and he kind of like shushes the heavenly chorus, um, <laughs> and he drowns people to shut them up. And I'm not like condoning drowning people so they stop talking, <laughs> but this is like enormously relatable to introverts like myself who sometimes just want quiet. But it's also really unexpected. And for you, as you were doing the research on this book, you know, this really detailed and highly skilled philological analysis that involves really digging into the archives and the archaeology, as well as reading these kind of texts in their original language, what jumped out to you? What was unexpected to you? Um, I think one of the most unexpected things was the fact that he's so human in all sorts of ways in terms of his emotional inner life. And one of the things that really hadn't, I hadn't quite grasped, I don't think, in kind of, particularly when I first started reading these texts, as I said, when I was a student, one of the things I hadn't quite grasped was just how intimate a portrait we get. I mean, it's a composite portrait drawn across lots of different biblical texts, but, but how intimate that portrait is in terms of his emotional, um, his interior life. And so, you know, there are various occasions in, in particularly in Hebrew Bible texts in which he cries and he weeps and, and he talks about this almost like belly pains, you know, he kind of suffers. I mean, in, in the ancient world, in, in Southwest Asian cultures at least, um, emotion, the, the heart wasn't understood to be the seat of, of emotion. I mean, the heart rather was a cognitive organ. That's where kind of thought processes and decision making and, and those sorts of activities happened but the emotions were very much located in the belly and in the innards um, and in the bowels, which, you know, to a certain extent, we understand that, you know, our minds are very much bound up with, with, with our bowels to a certain extent. Look at the language that we use, and you know, we feel sick to our stomachs and, you know, shit ourselves in fear. I mean, so, you know, this is, we still carry that kind of language, um, that, that responsiveness in our language today. But this is exactly the same about this God Yahweh and that he, he talks about the way his, his innards cause him pain when he's when he's grieving emotionally or when he's making a hard decision I mean admittedly some of those decisions about am I going to kill these people or not and he doesn't really want to but he kind of has to um but he still grieves and it was that very intimate portrayal of of a of a god who feels really greatly and I and I found that quite moving in a funny sort of way yeah, it's funny because um, in the history of sort of like, when does an individual self emerge? The individual self, um, a classicist will tell you, emerges when people kind of have that inner dialogue, mm. um, when they're kind of conflicted about a decision, like whether or not to kill people. And yet when we're talking about God, people tend to think that the, that kind of conflict within God, God changing God's mind, those kinds of things are perceived as sort of an inherent weakness for a deity, but a sort of sign of individuality and sort of real personhood in human beings. So there's something so relatable about hearing about the kind of God that you're sketching for us in your book that is not just the God who gets angry, the kind of vengeful God that yeah. sort of certain kind of anti-Semitic tropes sort of trot out about the Hebrew Bible, but a God who's sort of grieving and crying but I can't help but want to talk about the innards um, and about God's bowels. And there's this is um, fable attributed to Aesop that we now have in, in modern society about you shouldn't kill the golden goose. But in the fable, they do kill the golden goose because they're like, well, if it's laying golden eggs, maybe its innards are also made of gold. And so you tell us about this God that's like, there's this kind of bronze skin and very human, but also not human. Yeah. <laughs> and certainly not an old white guy. 
And um, if I was, and you do this autopsy at the end of your book, if I was to cut open the body of God, what would I find inside him? And would anything be missing? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, we would certainly find the major organs, the lungs and the heart and the bowels and the belly and the stomach. Um, I don't think we'd find excrement. Um, I don't think we'd find urine. Um, and we certainly wouldn't find blood. This is um, the body of God is, is it's very corporeal and it, and it was understood to be material that the certain sorts of aspects of the cosmos that were otherworldly, they weren't immaterial. They were understood to have a material quality. So even something like the word spirit um, in Greek pneuma, in Hebrew, it's ruach. That tends to be translated that we tend to assume we import these kind of more modern constructs of spirit and meaning something as immaterial. But but these were understood to be to be material substances and properties, these sorts of winds and spirits and breaths. Um, so this was a body that was very much human like, but it wasn't human in the sense that it contained blood. Uh, he couldn't bleed. He couldn't um, he, he couldn't die. Uh, some gods could. The god Baal, who was basically his cousin culturally he died and rose again three days later um many that hundreds and hundreds of years before the um, the jesus stories came around um but yeah this was a god who was whose body contained the major organs in in his torso but didn't contain some of the messier stuff um although he it probably you would probably find semen but not necessarily excrement or urine that is fascinating no excrement no urine maybe semen no blood but tears yeah definitely it's, tears. because the eyes the eyes that the word in the hebrew the word for eyes is the same as the word for a spring like a spring of water mm -hmm. and in some of these ancient cultures and it's very similar um across a lot of ancient southwest asian languages but i mean primarily those that all share a semitic origin but in some of these um cultures like in Mesopotamian texts you get the idea that the the head was understood to be full of water it was like almost like a kind of a well or a cistern full of water so that when you cried this was kind of like this water store kind of leaking out of your eyes and you know we look as I think we always need to be really careful about the way that we talk about the past I mean I I enjoy talking about about this kind of ancient deity and I do see him very much as an ancient deity and a part of his own cultural context um but these weren't unsophisticated people with unsophisticated ideas about deities. It was just simply a different way of being in the world. And it was a different way of thinking about the world. And it was a different way of thinking about bodies. There were, you know, human bodies as well as otherworldly bodies. Um, they were no less sophisticated than our own. It was just different, that's all, just different. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I think one of the things that when people think about um, what would be significant about uh, a divine body is the ways in which it would kind of act on people in the present, because some of us would look more like that divine body than others. Yeah. Um, and that would kind of privilege those bodies. And one of the things that I think about in my work is about disability. Mm. And it's very clear that in the Garden of Eden, God is walking around. He walks around all over the place. Um, you have like some really wonderful readings to do with God's feet that I think are fascinating and took me in really unexpected places. But at some point in the Hebrew Bible, sort of, it seems like during the exile, uh, God sits down in a chariot slash throne. And has he gotten up yet? And there is a name for a throne that has wheels on it or a chair that has wheels on it. It's a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is on behalf of, you know, people who maybe don't conform to like the divine body. Um, you spoke about his hair going white. He might be aging. Is, is God still, I, I know it sounds almost impossible to talk about an omnipotent being being unable to do something, but does God still walk around or does he ride in his wheelchair? That's one of the interesting things is that um, his being seated and enthroned, it starts from a place in which, um, so he talks about the Jerusalem temple and he says, this is the place for the soles of my feet where I shall place my, face, my feet and, you know, this is my place, my feet aren't going to move. And then the Babylonians, you know, a few centuries later, the Babylonians invade, destroy the Jerusalem temple. And 
in that particular context, a context in which um, the destruction, I mean, it's, it, oh, it feels really weird to be talking about this given what's going on at Ukraine in Ukraine at the moment. Um, but when a foreign nation invades, the thing you do is you, you don't just kill and destroy, you also um, target the cultural heart of a place. Um, you target the things that are most symbolically valuable to people as well as those things that are economically valuable and temples were prime targets for that so even though you fear you know you were you were basically risking these deities in these temples from you know really playing havoc with you and punishing you it was still worth the while going into a foreign territory when you were trying to invade or destroy or subjugate it and destroying the temple and then basically kidnapping godnapping the cult statue of the deity and carrying it off into captivity as a prisoner of war and so this is what people really struggle with so Yahweh's worshippers when his temple was destroyed in the 6th century BCE they were well God's been godnapped he's been taken captive and so you find a lot of the texts in the bible that are responding to this saying no 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 he has deliberately done this he has deliberately abandoned his temple but the thing is the idea of him getting up from his from being enthroned in his temple from walking out was really difficult because it suggests it suggests a mobility that undermines the sense of permanence and security and territoriality that came with this deity. He was a patron deity of, his, of Jerusalem. Um, and so the prophet Ezekiel decides that actually, yeah, his throne has got wheels on it. And so you have this image of, you know, in my head, I call it the mobile throne, which, which makes my British students laugh because obviously, but it doesn't really work in the US because everyone calls them cell phones, it doesn't work at all. But he has a mobile phone, throne. And he kind of wheels himself out of the temple and wheels himself off to Babylon. So he takes control by means of this wheeled chair or wheeled chariot or throne or whatever. He takes control of his own destiny in that way and tries to tries to present himself as a deity who is who has decided this. He has decided that the Babylonians are going to destroy his temple. And so in that sense, I think from a disabilities perspective, what's so interesting is that it actually renders a wheelchair um, a very empowering symbol, a very empowering kind of um, object or extension of his person. Um, so in that sense, and I've never really thought about it before until you said that, but I, but I can see the, a very sort of positive image for the, for the chair there. But on the other hand, you know, the reason he's sitting down so much is um, because, yeah, he's basically putting his feet up, like he is there, he's secure, he doesn't need to kind of get up and fight like he used to do. Yeah, um, and that sort of leads into my my next question about God, um, beyond the fact that like I think it is empowering for people to look at a deity and see more of themselves and disability and people with disabilities generally. There's not tons of that in the Bible speaking from personal experience. There's not a lot of like relating to the divine yeah. in one's human frailties. But in terms of like God is a warrior. Um, and I think if people are thinking about an embodied deity in the Hebrew Bible, they know that the God who conquers, the God who kills, the God who punishes, the God who rewards, that kind of omnipotent ruler or warrior. But at certain moments, you kind of show God performing these other tasks, like he's sort of a vineyard worker at one point, a kind of, which is a fairly like, low status work in, in the ancient world. And this was kind of an unexpected part of God's CV for me. Like I didn't know <laughs> that this was on his resume, but that he was, um, you know, in addition to creating the universe, also enjoyed, you know, a tipple um, <laughs> now and then. And so, and I think again, that sort of, um, it's possible for people to kind of relate to that in certain ways. So what kind of, what else, um, what other internships did God do <laughs> um, other than sort of volunteering at a vineyard? I mean, the vineyard thing is really interesting because that is a scene, it's in Isaiah, and it's a scene where he basically, a century spots him walking back from Edom, which is what we now call is Southern Jordan basically today. And he says, oh, you know, who is this like very glamorous looking warrior striding towards us? Why, why are his robes all stained red? And he says, oh, I've been treading, you know, treading grapes, basically. I've been in the vineyard. Um, but then obviously he then reveals that it's not grapes that he's been treading and trampling. It's human bodies he's been out fighting. Um, and what's so interesting about that is that, yeah, the vineyard, it was a low status job to a certain extent and a joyous, you know, is associated with joyous times. Um, but this is something that Yahweh does on his own. 
Like normally if you're in a vineyard, like lots of ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian images, frescoes of showing people treading grapes, you have to do it in groups. It's impossible just to do it on your own. But this is a God who can do that. So in that sense, yeah, on his resume, he's like, I did it all by myself. You know, he would have definitely got the job at the local vineyard. But then the other things he does, I mean, he buries Moses. He works as a, he's a mortuary worker in the book of Deuteronomy. And it's a translation that you, you very rarely see in, in English Bibles. Um, because the way in which the Hebrew has been adjusted by later translators who are uncomfortable with the idea, they, they you know, the text actually says Moses died and, you know, he's with God and God says, right, you're going to die now. Moses drops dead. Um, and then it says, and he buried him. And it's, it's God buried Moses. But this is a translation that's often sort of, it's been corrected um, by very pious ancient scribes who felt that it was completely improper for God to render himself polluted by means of contact with a corpse even a corpse that you know even Moses corpse was polluting and so in English translations we read and they buried him um so people just assume oh, it was the ancient Israelite tribes that buried Moses so yeah we see we see God as a mortuary worker but we also see him as an author I mean this is a God who like enjoys making lists and writing books and obviously writing the Ten Commandments and writing the Torah um so yeah he's got various various jobs in his resume <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the translational issue with the mortuary work is really interesting because, you know, as you as you alluded to, coming into contact with corpses renders you impure mm. and thus unable to go into holy spaces until some period of time or cleansing has elapsed. For the Greeks and Romans, mortuary work was done by enslaved workers who sometimes weren't allowed into certain parts of the city. So there's something really powerful about God doing that kind of work and engaging in the kind of work that according to certain parts of the Hebrew Bible would render you impure to be in God's presence. Yeah. So there's a sort of a tension and an irony there. It's yeah, like but, but, but also I think it reflects a, a particular historical and cultural reality in which, you know, before the Greco-Roman period, um, mortuary work like this tended to be performed by families. And so, um, particularly women actually. Uh, so there's a sense in which there, this was a world in which the physical engagement with the dead was much more common. And even Yahweh himself, um, we've got tomb inscriptions dated from the eighth century BC, where it's not just, you don't, in tombs, you don't just find um, appeals to Yahweh for blessings, but you also find this huge divine hand inscribed into this rock in the tomb as almost as if it's the hand of God coming down to protect the inhabitant of the tomb and then the, the inscription asks Yahweh and his wife Asherah um, to protect the occupant of the tomb you know this was a world in which the dead were con it wasn't so much an afterlife it was more like a post-mortem existence um, and the dead needed protecting in their tombs from various you know from tomb robbers from those who had disturbed their bones and from other sort of demonic forces that, that might um, disturb their their eternal sleep so yeah in in Hebrew Bible texts um, God has much more contact with the dead than perhaps we might assume. That is really fascinating. And you mentioned something just now that I think will have caught a lot of people's attention. And I already see that it's in the Q&A. So even though it's a little early, I have to ask you, God in his what, Asherah? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did I not mention that? His wife. <laughs> who, who is that? And tell us about her, because I think, you know, everyone wants to know. Yeah, so... Um... Asherah is, she was, she was one of the, the longest lived goddesses across um, the Southern Levant, well, the whole of the Levant, but particularly the Southern Levant. And originally she started off as uh, <laughs> the wife of God's dad. <laughs> I'm just like dropping like bombshell after bombshell. After. I'm so sorry. But yeah, um, so in a polytheistic system in which Yahweh worshipped emerged, uh, there was a high god and his consort, um, the high goddess, and her name was, in Hebrew, it's Asherah. Um, in other Semitic languages, it's um, a theorat and other sort of related terms. Um, but yeah, we have inscriptions. We have lots of references to Asherah in the Hebrew Bible, normally by its biblical writers saying, these idolatrous Israelites who, who put a statue of Asherah in the temple of Yahweh, um, who plant her cult symbol next to Yahweh's altars these are terrible things and you mustn't do these things which obviously implies that people are doing them if you're being told not to do it but then um yeah in the 1970s and 80s Hebrew inscriptions um were found at various locations um including one in the West Bank 
in which it's, you know, these clear references to Yahweh and Asherah. And now most scholars um, would agree that far from being a, a deviant um, or, sort of, or even a foreign Canaanite element of, of ancient Israelite religion, the Asherah was generally held to be the wife and consort of Yahweh. Um, yeah, but she didn't kind of make it through yeah, the shift from polytheism into what scholars term monotheism not a great term it's a very problematic label but but what looks to be a single deity system yeah obviously asherah fell by the wayside unfortunately yeah we i mean obviously <laughs> the idea of that of god having a wife and what that might mean for monotheism we're gonna unpack that a bit more but just to stay with her because i feel like she probably <laughs> could use a little bit more attention um Tell us more about her. What does she do? And also, she was originally his stepmother, it seems. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Can it's we a, hear more about the family of gods? <laughs> it's a weird system, isn't it? So this was this was a world in which um, deities were networked into households. Um, to be a solitary deity was to be completely, I mean, it was a, a peculiar thing. Deities were like people. We don't do well when we're on our own. Um, we live in families and households and sort of communities. And the same was true across the ancient world of, of deities. And so, yeah, it looks like originally, I mean, there's a fantastic poem at the end of the book of Deuteronomy in which we kind of get a little glimpse into, into Yahweh's backstory, into God's backstory. And there it, des it describes, um, it uses a term called Elyon, the Most High, which was an epithet of the god Ale, um, who was the high god across this region, the head of the pantheon. Um, and it talks about ale dividing up the peoples or the nations according to the numbers of the sons of God or the divine sons. And Yahweh is included among one of these divine sons of ale. And, you know, Yahweh is a portion of the people of Jacob. So in other words, the Israelites. Um, so we can see how even in this kind of fossilized poem in, in the book of Deuteronomy, you've still got this kind of a glimpse of a myth in which originally Yahweh was not the highest God. Ale was the high God. Gradually, Yahweh historically seems to have eclipsed his, his father, if you like, overthrown his father and taken on his roles and functions. Um, but we also get in the, another poem in the book of Genesis where you have this beautiful um, series of, um, it's almost like an incantation, a ritual incantation, a series of blessings where different divinized and divine beings are called on to bless certain individuals. Um, and there you get a reference to the goddess known as breasts and womb. And most scholars, again, think this is probably a reference to this high mother goddess, Asherah, because that was her role. She was the mother of, this, of all of these divine children. She and her consort were the divine parents of all the, of the frontline deities, the ones that did all the kind of the main work, um, you know, wars and, and sort of pestilence and music and all that other stuff that, that you know, frontline deities need to do. Um, but yeah, it's an extraordinary kind of glimpse into the world before the editing of a lot of these texts and the reshaping of a lot of these texts into a more monotheistic kind of form. But also the very fact that these little poetic fragments that show this polytheistic kind of backstory, if you like, were so important that they couldn't just be kind of excised out of these traditions. They couldn't just be kind of cussed and got rid of these. They were too important. Um, and so they stayed in the Bible. Um, and which is, you know, and I'm glad that they did because they're, they're beautiful poems apart from anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there are lots of people who do love to hear about Asherah. They want to hear about goddesses, even if they come from religious traditions in which that's sort of not a part of their belief system um, because monotheism. And certainly yeah. we can come back to monotheism and how the sort of encounter with Greek and Roman philosophy ends up sort of perhaps erasing some of these traditions from various forms of religious practice. But I guess what I, I would like to ask first is when you were talking about deities procreating and producing other deities, you say, I think it might be the last line in your book that we made God in our image. Um, when gods procreate, are we looking at, are the, do, does Asherah have a womb? Does it take nine months to produce a baby deity? Do they grow up? Um, is, was there an infancy? Was Yahweh a child at some point? Certainly we have stories about the childhood of Jesus that mm. aren't even in the Bible. What do we know about his teen years? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, that was one of the things, you know, so when you ask me, you know, what, what bits are missing? I mean, in terms of, of his life story, those bits are missing. We don't get a sense 
that Yahweh of Yahweh as a, as a baby, if you like. Um, we do get him as a father. I mean, he, he, there's a lot of fathering and mothering image in the Bible that's applied to him. Um, but generally speaking, in, in the broader ancient Southwest Asian culture, um, the gods did everything better than humans. So whereas it would take nine months for humans to gestate and birth a baby, it takes nine days for a god to do it. Then again, when gods have sex, um, they have sex for like seven days and seven nights without stopping. Um, which might, oh, This know. does sound like a better balance. Of, <laughs> it of does, it does sound like just generally it's the right way, I know. Yeah. But yeah, so they do everything better. Um, but we do get, we, you do, I mean, in Mesopotamian texts, you do um, hear Marduk, who is the great god of Babylon. Um, there are a few texts that talk to him about when he was born. He was already born with these, you know, amazing mantles or kind of um, auras of, of radiance of divinity on him. Um, but equally, you know, they say he was so amazing that he was born with, you know, four eyes. Um, so there's, there, you do get the sense, you get hints that across the broader cultural landscape, there is a sense that gods could be born, but you don't get much of a sense, particularly not, um, yeah, you don't get much of a sense, I've not really thought about it, not, don't get much sense of them growing up as such. In early, very early myths you do, so a lot of Sumerian myths, you get the sense that that gods can grow up and age. Goddesses particularly, um, some of them don't tend to stay, they, they, they start off as young and nubile and, and then unfortunately tend to get raped by another god. And then all of a sudden they're old and um, cynical. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think what we're sort of talking about really is change. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's obviously, we don't really talk about the body of God anymore. Um, and I wonder if at least one of the reasons for that is that we're deeply uncomfortable with change, both in our own bodies um, and our own human frailties, but also in God, right? People do get upset that God changes his mind. Um, that's something that people consider to be a problem about the God of the Hebrew Bible. And I'm wondering if one reason we don't talk about these things is because it's really our own discomfort with ourselves that leads us to be uncomfortable with God having a body. Is there any truth to that? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, in some ways, it's it's almost it's almost what the Christian story turns on, though, isn't it? It's about a discomfort with the frailty and the the materiality of the human body. It, the the very fact that it it decays and it will die um, and it will disappear. And it, it's that sense that I think people found that very difficult, particularly with the you know as a particular kind of Platonic philosophy took hold. Um, that started to change ideas about the divine can't be changeable. The divine can't be material. The divine has to be completely other to everything else that's in the that's in the, the human world in the in the universe. And so, because the universe is material and decays and changes, um, then that means that God has to be completely other from that. So God cannot be material, cannot change, cannot decay. And so that's where those ideas come from. But in a way, Christianity kind of is almost continues to compensate for that in some ways by rendering this kind of the only correct body of God as being the the body of Jesus um who does to, you know who does is damaged and and who bleeds and who dies um and then obviously resurrects again and kind of to 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 make it somehow um possible for humans to also overcome decay and death theologically yeah. at least yeah it's funny because reading your book gave me a new testament scholar like a completely different perspective on passages about the body of Jesus. So Je Jesus weeping is the shortest verse in the Bible, yeah. in the Gospel of John. And that always seemed like this distinctly New Testament human Jesus thing. Until reading your book, I realized that all of these things that I associated with Jesus actually could have been hereditary um, because the <laughs> God of the Hebrew Bible does them too. And I know that your book is about God's body and is focused on the Hebrew Bible. But I do think that one of the things that I'm not even sure if you meant to do this. Um, but one of the things that your book does is it really causes people who have a greater interest in, in the New Testament for religious reasons to rethink those passages. And I think it really adds a lot to um, the story of Christianity as well. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the process, the historical processes and the ideas that mean that we no longer talk about the body of God. You kind of 
gesture to platonic philosophy you reference jesus but why don't we talk about this anymore and have we lost something by denying the sort of body mm -hmm. of the god of the hebrew bible i mean i think that's the thing there are all sorts of different reasons i mean there's cultural moments in the life of god if you like um that led to him gradually being disembodied um in the book i talk about it as like I start the book with a, with a quotation from Alice in Wonderland, the one about the Cheshire cat and who disappears from the tip of his tail, slowly, slowly, slowly disappears until all that's left is his grin. And, and in a way, it's a similar thing with God is that all you're left with is, is God's breath. That's the only bit of his bodily form that, that's left um, and is divinized and becomes the spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit or, or um, the Holy Ghost, as some people call it. Um, so there are various cultural moments that, cut, that happen before the rise of the Jesus movement um, that that start to disembody God. One of them is the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Um, one of them is the ban on the use of images in worship that, you know, you cannot use images to worship your God. You know, uh, the second commandment, which was put into place relatively late in the history of the 10 commandments um, and reflects the fact that people were using cult statues of, of God in their worship. But it's also, um, once the Hebrew texts are translated into Greek, so around about the third to the second centuries BCE, um, you start to get, it becomes much easier to, not just to translate from language to language, but to translate and project cultural ideas from one place to another, from one thought system to another. Um, and that's what begins to happen once the texts are circulating in Greek. And most people were reading these texts, not in Hebrew, but in Greek outside of, of Roman Palestine. Um, once that starts to happen, so you, you start to, to get a rereading, you know, every translation is an interpretation. And you start to get a rereading of these very traditional Hebrew passages that were reflecting good old fashioned Southern Levantine mythology. Suddenly they start to become cutting edge Jewish metaphysics, very much influenced by the rise of certain, not just Platonic ideas, a lot of Aristotelian ideas and various other Stoic philosophies too, but a gradual shift away from the notion that the divine could be material and this increasing emphasis on the immateriality incorporeality of div the divine full stop, however you imagine the divine to be. And gradually those ideas came to dominate. They didn't cut, it took centuries and centuries in, of Christian thought and argument and fighting and killing to get to this point. But gradually that became the dominant view within Christianity that God couldn't possibly have a body because the only way he possibly could have a body was in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, that's the only way that God could have a body. And it was about that exclusivity of bodily of divine corporeality in the person of Jesus that was so important it couldn't have had any other kind of form before it was in Judaism in mainstream Judaism it was slower a slower process the rabbis um the early rabbis you know from up until the sixth century um, and, and and beyond that were very much more comfortable with the idea of God still having a body they would talk about God you know um binding you know wearing a, a prayer shawl um and, and binding tefillin on his arm and praying like that. I mean, they were much more comfortable with the idea. And, you know, Islamic, uh, with the emergence of Islamic philosophies too, that greatly engaged with and shaped a lot of Christian and Jewish theology too. I mean, you start to get this idea about absolutely the incorporeality, immateriality of the divine. Um, so it was, a, it was a slow death of his body. It was a slow disembodiment, um, but yeah. It's a kind of a shame. I, you asked me, you know, what do we, what, what have we lost? And I think we've lost, you know, it's very hard to have a social relationship with an abstract, which is what God ultimately becomes. Um, and the reason why bodies are so important to humans is because that, that is how, that is how we are. I mean, we are our bodies. We're not different from our bodies. We're not, we don't inhabit bodies. We are our bodies. And it's by means of our bodies that we socialize with one another, which is why it's so much easier to have a relationship with an, otherworldly or dare I say imaginary being um, who you imagine to have some kind of bodily form than it is to have a relationship with an abstract and which is why we still hang on to this language today even Christians and Jewish people who say that God doesn't have a body you can't quite let go of talking about what God sees and he hears um, you know th that he he talks you know we still use this bodily language today and it's not just poetry it's a hangover it's a relic, if you like, from much, much older ideas and traditions in which God really did hear because he had ears and he really did see because he had eyes. Yeah, 
I, I think uh, picking up on that idea of sociality and going to some of the questions in the chat, um, a lot of people are interested in that. So, so take things in order. Um, Joe said, wonderful talk. Is there much or any information on how Yahweh worked his way to the top of the hierarchy of gods? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. And the, the short answer is it's really frustrating because we don't quite know how it happened. And it's one of those things that we just can't. I mean, what's so interesting about ancient Israel and Judah is that we have very few texts from these, particularly these Iron Age kingdoms. You know, we have mm -hmm. a few inscriptions. I mean, maybe it's because they were mostly writing on scrolls, which, you know, tend to, to disappear in the archaeological record rather than writing on stone monuments. Um, but we don't really know how it happened. All we know is that it looks probably by about, you know, by about the 10th century, say maybe slightly before that, the end of the very end of the late Bronze Age, um, that sort of shift seems to have started. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't know how it happened. And I wish we did, but we just don't have enough solid evidence. The biblical texts are too late and we don't have any other comparative evidence to talk about Yahweh because nobody else, he was a minor deity. Nobody else was really interested in him. Yeah, and, and sort of picking up on that kind of unknown question, one of the um, questioners asked about the theme in sort of Mesopotamian literature of gods committing patricide. Yeah, um, yeah. What other elements um, are being kind of borrowed from mythologies, kind of other sort of elements like that? And, you know, did Yahweh potentially kill El? Is he like buried next to Moses somewhere? <laughs> An unmarked grave. Right. Um, do you know, it's possible because, yeah, absolutely, the patricide theme is really, really common, and we find it in Hittite mythology, obviously Greek mythology, we find it in um, certain Babylonian, um, well, primarily um, Akkadian, and, and some Sumerian texts too, so you, you, you do get the idea, and deicide is common in these myths as well, so I think it's possible um, there could have been a myth in which Yahweh overthrew his father, I mean, some people say there's a fantastic um, motif that you find repeated. It's in Isaiah and you also find it in Ezekiel, which talks about what looks to be a divine or semi-divine tyrant who strides up the cosmic mountain to overthrow. He says, I'm going to put myself in the, on the throne of Ale, on the top of the holy mountain. I'm going to make myself God. And God says, no, you're not. And he throws him down into the underwear. He says, you're not, you're no longer God. You are immortal. And I wonder if that does contain just a little bit of a hint of, of a myth in which it was originally Yahweh who was striding up the holy mountain to sit on the throne of Ale, possibly. Yeah, that, uh, that's, re that's really interesting. Um, one of our um, questioners wants to ask about the, the more positive side of um, it's positive. <laughs> father son relationships oh. uh, between divine beings, because obviously in Christianity, um, God sort of defined as God the father now. That's the mm. element of his like complex familial relationships that have sort of persisted in Christianity. And is this true of Yahweh as well? In the sense of him being a father? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in a, th th yeah, there are some remarkable texts. Um, and let's think, people say to me, that's not in the Bible. And I say, well, here it is. You know, look at, look at the footnotes in the book. Like, it'll, it'll give you the text reference. And they go, oh, yeah, it is in the Bible. So he has, we see this beautiful image of him in the book of Deuteronomy in a, another poem in which it's talking about God being the father of his people, which is a very common kind of language to, to use. Um, but it's about the baby Jacob, um, who seems to be standing in for the whole people of Israel. But he's not called Jacob, he's called Jeshurun, which is interesting in itself. It's a, a name packed with kind of mythological nuances. Um, but God nurses this child in the wilderness. And there's this amazing scene where, in the poem, where it talks about, um, he looked at him, you know, Jeshurun, this baby boy, was the apple of his eye. That's the way that the English translators had generally, conventionally rendered one Hebrew idiom with an English idiom. So it means, you know, to be absolutely the center of you know somebody's world also somebody's love and gaze but the Hebrew idiom that the the phrase apple of his eye is replacing um is literally the little man in the eye and it refers to the little reflection that you can see of yourself when you look really close into somebody's eyes so just that image of of Yahweh cradling this baby boy and looking so deeply into his eyes that he's he can you can see your reflection in his eye I think it's beautiful and it's a very tender portrait of a of a fatherly 
you know what we would understand to be a, a proper fatherly love the kind of fatherly love that we, we would we would hope for ourselves um so yeah i like that he also has a daughter a breath-born daughter this goddess wisdom who comes from his mouth um very similar to the way that certain greek and um, certain egyptian deities are, are born um and she seems to be um you know she's his little child and she's with him at the creation of the world and is helping him it's almost like he's kind of this architect he's building the cosmos and she's almost like there holding his like toolkit and measuring things out with him um but yeah she she quickly you know she becomes this kind of she's this divine wisdom figure and perhaps it's just personification but it's a female personification and it's a very kind of father daughter relationship between them which i which i particularly like as well yeah that, i mean that's much more intimate than just the, the sort of rather bland language of god the father doesn't bring out the intimacy yeah of, of that scene it's sort of worth putting that body back in there um, yeah. for christian theology too um to go to our next question which is quite specific but you kind of painted this portrait of this sort of southwestern mesopotamian deity who as he immigrates or is sort of trafficked to sort of the mediterranean and the sort of greco-roman world is sort of the distinctiveness of him and his body is sort of erased in the Cheshire cat image that you had. Um, Father Jarrell Robinson Brown asks, would you say there's any connection between what happens to God's body in the Hebrew scriptures and the sort of, you know, he put it in quotation marks, so-called heresy of docetism, you know, by which, you know, Jesus only sort of seems to be a human being. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. All those early Christian debates and, you know, and they were Christian. I mean, just because they were later condemned as, you know, heretics. Um, you know, they were they were as Christian as, in, as anybody else. If the word, even if the label Christian is appropriate at that time, which I'm not altogether sure it it is. But yeah, um, all sorts of debates going on up into the fourth century about, you know, was Jesus's body just a phantasm? Was it a fake body? Was this a body that God put on um, to pretend to be human? And it, and it was it had huge ramifications. I mean, the debates. I mean, as, as you know, Camden, the debates that were had about you know, what was, was Jesus really God? Was he really man? Because if you said he wasn't really human, then that meant he couldn't have suffered and couldn't have died, which makes a mockery of the notion that his resurrection somehow was a proper resurrection and obviously makes a mockery of them, therefore what his resurrection means for, for believers. Um, but if you say, so he had to be properly a man, but then how can, a, how, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean that this was God as a man? Does this, does this mean that, did he really eat? Did he really drink? Did he really defecate? And these debates were hugely important because, it, as I said, it, it it really got to the heart of this the nature of Christ. Was he properly human? Or was he properly God? Could he be one? Could he be both? Could he be neither? Um, and the same debates were going on about Moses as well, actually, in Jewish tradition. Like, you know, when Moses went up Mount Sinai, um, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, did he defecate when he was up there? Because that's holy space. And as we talked about before, you can't pollute holy space. Um, so they were really important questions. So I do think that in some of those theological debates among some of the, um, not just the church fathers, but a lot of these other important theologians in the first four centuries, you do get pointed to certain sorts of passages and certain allusions are made to Hebrew Bible passages where um, the bodiliness of, of God um, and particularly, you know, passages like the contest on, of Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, where Elijah basically, um, says to the prophets of Baal, you know, your God's not listening to you. Maybe he's, maybe he's gone to the bathroom. That's why, you know, he's too busy, like, you know, straining at stool to be able to answer your prayers. And so those sorts of texts were brought into play in debating about the nature of God. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a, I mean, it's an interesting, it's, it's some people had a problem with the, you know, origin himself was, you know, talked about these stupid, Christians who thought that God had a body so big that his head reached into the heavens and his feet stretched down to earth I mean but for other Christians you know we've got some early gospels and similar early lives of Jesus that talk about Jesus himself having a body that was exactly like that so these were common these ideas had a lot of cultural currency and this currency remained live and potent and valuable for many centuries um, beyond the lives of the Hebrew bible text themselves yeah, and I think that I, it could sound to people that even having this conversation is somehow anti-religious, you know, or irreverent. But I think what your book shows is it's not just the sort of emotional payoff of looking at the body of God and 
in terms of how one would relate to it and think about one's own position in the world. But also, this is a real intellectual conversation. It's a real debate. And these are debates that people had, both in rabbinic texts and in early Christianity, with reference to precisely these passages and yeah. these questions. You know, we're not the first people to ask about excrement and whether or not God or Jesus ever went to the bathroom. That yeah. was a very serious debate involving bishops and priests. Um, and this is not just sort of sort of prov provoc provocation or something like that, just trying to be sort of um, clever and cute. Um, it's a real theological conversation. It has real intellectual value for how we look at uh, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, sort of philosophical dilemmas and all kinds of things. Um, we're nearly out of time, but as it's Friday, it seems like we should certainly end with genitals. And... Um, <laughs> Angela asks, was Yahweh circumcised? And can you comment on the narrative in which God tries to kill Moses and Zipporah um, mm, because of the circumcision debate? Yeah. Affair? So, so that, so firstly, was God circumcised? Well, the rabbis certainly thought he was. Um, they have a big debate about um, worrying about circumcision and worrying mainly about whether Noah and Adam were circumcised. So in Genesis, we're told that Abraham, you know, God says to Abraham, right, I want you to circumcise yourself. Um, and this is what's going to make you tamim, which basically means unblemished, whole. Um, it sort of perfects the body in some ways. And that means that you can walk with me. And he, you know, he literally walks with him, but it also means to kind of be bonded together in this covenant relationship. And so the rabbis worried because Noah was, was equally described as whole, unblemished, and yet he wasn't said to be circumcised so where what you know did God forget to tell Noah that he needed to be circumcised why did he you know and then what about Adam you know God created Adam and, and you know did, but was Adam created circumcised or not and the rabbis were really concerned about this and but they ended up agreeing and I think quite sensibly they said well you know we know that um you know we know that Noah must have been must have been circumcised because he's called Tamim but and Adam must have been made made you know created circumcised because it says in the text and god created man in his own image and we know that adam must have been created circumcised because god is circumcised too so they just assumed that that circumcision is is something that that god experiences and and yeah he was circumcised and that text in exodus about moses and zipporah um the text is very confusing because it just uses primarily male pronouns. So we don't know what's happening, who is doing what to whom exactly. But we're told that Moses and Zipporah, his wife and their little boy are going along the road at night, which is always a bad sign um, in a lot of biblical stories. And then Yahweh, he, he, Yahweh encounters them and Yahweh tried to kill him. No, sorry. And he tried to kill him. And we don't know whether it's Yahweh trying to kill Moses Yahweh trying to kill Moses' son or Moses trying to kill his son. But whatever happens, somebody is trying to kill somebody else. And the only way that this is averted is when Zipporah circumcises her son and daubs the bloodied foreskin on somebody's genitalia, either Moses or his son, we don't know. And then she says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me, a bridegroom of blood by circumcision. Now, all that language is playing on the word for bridegroom is very similar to words that are associated with circumcision in related languages. So it looks like, is this some kind of prenuptial fertility ritual of circumcision that's kind of been given this new location within this particular narrative or story? Well, we don't know. But yeah, certainly circumcision stops God killing, it seems. Um, which is interesting because baby boys are circumcised on the eighth day, which is normally when you would give to God the sacrifice to God, the firstborn of your lambs and, and your flocks and your herds. Um, so yes, yeah, some people have argued that it's circumcision and apotropaic, right? It protects you from harm. Who knows? Um, but yeah, God is circumcised. Well, on that note, and in knowledge that like, God really would like me to get a massage this weekend, that is what God would do. Um, I cannot help but like, thank you for this really rich and rewarding conversation, but also for the book that is so thought provoking. I thought maybe as a Bible scholar that I wouldn't you know, learn so much from this book, but it is so beautifully written, um, so relevant sort of modern conversations about theology and about how we think about ourselves and just an incredible balance of sort of accessible writing, but just rich information. So thank you so much.
Well, thank you. And thank you so much for a brilliant conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you both. This talk was so cool. I learned so much. I'm like, as soon as it stops snowing, I'm going to run to the bookstore and get my copy so I can read it. I have so many questions and I wish we could <laughs> go on forever, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Candida, for having this conversation, giving your Friday night. And thank you to everyone who is tuning in and watching and showing up for authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and the incredible staff at Harvard Bookstore. Thank you again for tuning in. If you would like to support Francesca and purchase the book, there is links in the chat if you would like to purchase God and Anatomy. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your night. Stay warm. Take care. Thank you.